I don't think so. Are you sure? I'm like, yes. If you feed her coconut, we will go to the hospital. And we're going to have to pay money. <laughs> She's like, <laughs> The okay. second biggest fear. <laughs> yeah, the second biggest fear for Asians, paying money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, that is the biggest fear. That's that's how you get them to not do shit. It'll cost you money. They're like, oh, no, we can't do it then. No. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to Anime Club After Dark, the podcast that delves into all things anime, manga, and otaku culture related. I'm your host, Alex, but you can call me Senpai. And joining me tonight, I have our czar of source material, John. Look at this photograph. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I did. Uh, <laughs> okay don't worry about it don't worry about it, it. it's fine it's fine um and we also have our own dr roxo chinoda you can't no want to do some co 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 cocaine oh the freaking clown from our metalocalypse okay yes yeah. so i want to say it took me a second to get that originally because he misspelled it in our doc <laughs> oh i didn't notice his shirt yeah i bro. thought it was like a deer what the heck a man deer no, no it's, it's that was like some fallout boy shirt it's, it's Dr. Roxo. <laughs> uh, for, first of all, uh, like if you've ever seen Metalop... Meta, 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 let me try that again. If you've ever seen Metalop... I can't say the fucking name of the show. Metalocalypse. That, thank you. Fucking goddamn. You're a real one. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't seen it, you're a real one? No, no, if you have seen it. Oh, I thought you said if you haven't seen it, you're no, a real one. No, if you one. have like, seen it, you're a real hey, one. Because that's... Pump the brakes. No. No, if that's... you're someone who's actually gone to a Death Clock uh, concert IRL, even more real, because that shit is fucking metal. Didn't you Chinoda just has. go a couple of months ago? Yeah. 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 No, I went to another one. Oh, you went to another one. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my goodness. Aren't they remaking the show? Are they? I thought no. They're, they're not remaking the, the movie. They're... Uh, they're not remaking it. They are uh, releasing the final thing, the movie. Uh, oh my god. I forgot what it's called, but yeah. Wait, the cartoon never ended? Technically, no. Oh. But they're ending it with a movie. Oh, okay. I, there was like some media coming out for it, and I was like, I don't remember. I, I did. Yeah, movie. Okay. I, That's I, why as, they're back in rotation. As much as sense. I would love to talk about that show for an entire hour and a half, um, that is the not The reason why, why you talk it's about not cocaine. Actually, it's not actually why we're here, but we are talking about something vaguely related to drugs. Um, yeah, uh, vaguely drugs. related. The good uh, kind, not the bad kind. YouTube, yeah. stop. Yeah, the, the good, the good kind of drugs. Uh, yeah, so we're gonna be talking about uh, the Apothecary Diaries. We are doing a spoiler cast on it. Um, another great show that aired at the very end of uh, 2023 last year, right alongside Free Run, which we have already done a spoiler cast on, and you should really go check that out if you haven't. Um, God, I just had the thought. Mau Mau would be hilarious on cocaine. <laughs> no. <laughs> Tell me I'm wrong. You're wrong. Yeah. I Bullshit. Don't, I don't, I don't want to see that because Mau Mau is too precious. Mau Mau is far too precious for that. Uh, she likes to stay low key. So, yeah, completely. Oh, wrong. that's true. Yeah. She'd probably one, just smoke some pot. <laughs> Yeah, yeah if that... anything, I feel like she'd be a weed girl. She has the hair. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so before we do get into the spoiler cast, I just want to remind everyone, uh, if you do like what you see here and want to see more, do considering dropping a like uh, and a subscribe. Um, it would really, really help us out. We're on a push to get to uh, 1K subs uh, by the end of the year. So hopefully we can do that. Um, and also, let us know down below in the comments what uh, you thought of Apothecary Diaries. And tell us if uh, anything we uh, talk about here is uh, we're wrong. Because, yeah, we love hearing that, too. I mean, I mean now? Someone the... in the... Well, hold on. Someone in the in the yeah. comments for our free run uh, uh, spoiler cast did point out that Shinoda's math was completely wrong about free run's age. Yeah. I did clown math, okay? Fuck off. <laughs> As opposed to regular math, which isn't as opposed to your regular math, which isn't also clown math, right? Yeah, <laughs> um, I can sometimes yeah. math. Let's uh, let's talk about it. So this was a uh, production uh, by Toho Animation Studio and OLM, aka the Pokemon Company. Um, 
And the music for this was done by a group of three people. Um, one of them being uh, Satoru Kosaki, whose music you've probably heard before in the Monogatari series, uh, Melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya, or Beastars. Um, by the way, the, the fucking soundtrack to Beastars is awesome. Um, our boy Kevin Pinkin makes, a, a, well, I wouldn't say a surprise appearance, but a, a welcome appearance in this Um you might remember his music from Made in Abyss, Tower of God, and he also did the uh, the OST for Star Wars Visions episode, The Village Bride, uh, my favorite episode of Star Wars Visions. <laughs> um, and it was also uh, another person that worked on this, uh, Alisa Oke Hazama, I hope I got that right, um, who worked on the music for Jujutsu Kaisen. Ooh, wait, which season? Uh, I didn't specify when I looked it up. It just said Jujutsu Kaisen, so I'm assuming worked on the music for both seasons. Oh, okay. Oh, that's still cool. Um, so I, I want to ask, before we talk about like OPs and EDs, are we all in agreement that the OST for this is pretty damn good? Oh, the I OST the is a goddamn it's, it's, banger. Yeah. Like, yeah. holy shit. It fits every scene so perfectly. I like. Yeah. They collaborated beautifully on this. I yeah I agree. I feel like there's a lot of a lot of music, especially in the quieter scenes, that really really fits well with the the emotions that they're trying to go for in in a lot of those scenes, especially the scenes the quieter scenes between uh, the two main characters, Mao Mao and uh, Jishi. Also, I want to I'm going to Jingxi what Jingxi Jingxi. I, I'm going. I'm going to apologize up front now. I am going to mispronounce all these characters' names. I am so sorry. Yeah, Alex is Chinese racist, so like, yes. as give him some to, like, forgiveness. Us not mispronouncing literally any other type of Asian name. <laughs> <laughs> like, come on, bro. I, I do my best. I do. I do my best. I'm not the best at, at pronouncing some of these names. And to be perfectly honest with you, I remember a lot of these characters based on their hair color, not their name. <laughs> same uh especially i remember the, uh, one I, I remember two characters it's mao mao and jing chi that's it mm. green and purple um <laughs> uh, so let's actually talk about the ops and eds since this was yeah. a 24 episode uh season we got two ops and two eds um so i want to ask like uh, from the ops which one was you guys favorite the second op that was ambivalent i, I liked Udu. the first op I originally was going to say the first OP because I was like, I like that a lot more. But the mm. second OP really grew on me because the visuals and stuff, too, are really good. Yes. I, I feel I feel the same way that you do. Like, when I first saw the second OP, I'm like, eh, I'm kind of iffy on this one. But the more I saw it, the more I'm like, yeah, this is actually pretty damn good. <laughs> it's just freaking uh, Stockholm Syndrome. It's because we've had the second OP for so long and continuously. <laughs> and it's most yeah. recency biased, too. Maybe, got, maybe we got they're OP, both really got good. Stockholm Central. They're both really yeah, good. They're, the they're both really good. Yeah. The per the first OP is called "Become a Flower." I'm not even gonna begin to try and pronounce the name of the person who put the who, who, who sang this. I'm sorry. Um, Shakai is the last name. I'll, I I can I can pronounce that. <laughs> um, now the EDs. Um, I was actually quite partial to the first ED, which is the spell by Ina the End. I also like the first ED more. Um, Love is Medicine yeah. by Wachi is is also pretty good, but I felt like the first op or first ED rather really, I don't know, it hit the themes of the show better. I thought in terms of the way the music felt. I don't know, that's I my personally... personal. Opinion, but... I personally like the uh, second OP and ED a lot more. Okay. Like, I just thought they hit a lot better, in my opinion. <laughs> they, they, I mean, both the second OP and ED have very different vibes than the first OP and ED, I think. And I, I, I you know, for me, like, the, the second OP kind of really grew on me. And then, but I, I just, the, something about that first OP just, I, I can't, I can't, I can't love it more than the second one. I don't know why, but there's just something about it that I really, really love. I think it's for the, for the ED in particular. I like the art style of the first ED more than the second one. And I think that's why it hits a little better for me. 
I um, think for me, it's the music itself that uh, really hits. Hmm. Like the art style, like both are really good. But for me, I think it's the music that really does it for me. Well, I'll tell you one thing that really did it for me throughout this entire anime watching it. Uh, can we talk about how beautiful the color palette is in this anime? Holy how- shit. They do the- not hold back no. at all. No. Like I the loved bright- it. The bright, vibrant colors that they use, especially for the background art, I absolutely adored it. I especially love the fact that even in winter, they didn't hesitate to use color. Like, winter mm. uh, in the show. They, like, even though they showed, yeah, there's less sun, but there was still plenty of color in the mm. world. I especially love that because a lot of shows... Uh, tend to show off uh, when it's winter. Yeah, it's just snow everywhere. So dreary it's white colors. everywhere. Yeah. yeah. Or it's uh, dark and dreary all the time. And it's yeah. like, no, this show do- doesn't do that. It's like, yeah, no, uh, this is still the world. It's still colorful. Holy shit. And they made it pop. I don't know how, but they kept it so consistent throughout the whole anime in terms of color palette. And it popped out visually. It was beyond impressive, in my opinion. Mm. Yeah. And this is another anime where I don't feel like, to be fair, throughout the run of this anime, there's very few action sequences. Um, But I feel like at no point during this anime did I ever feel like the animation quality ever dipped. No. Maybe I'm... Maybe I'm wrong, but I just I can't think of a single scene where I felt like the animation quality went down to a point where it was super noticeable. I think they did a fun little trick uh, to circumvent that. Instead of uh, dropping animation quality when uh, it wasn't needed, what they did was switch to chibi forms where they can uh, get away with it because it still fit in the style of the world and the show. It's the comedic element that worked alongside everything. Mm. And because they uh, made it chibi, made it cute, but still make made it work, we didn't care because yeah, it still works. Yeah. I think that's uh that's my theory anyways, but I feel like that's pretty true. Yeah. I also like I guess this kind of goes with the writing too, which I can talk about before we actually get into like plot details. When I was watching this, not just because of like the visual gags and stuff, but the writing in general, I got a similar feeling as to when I watched like Full Metal Alchemist, for example. Um when I watched Full Metal Alchemist back in the day, and I assume this is still true, even though I haven't seen it in years, I haven't rewatched it in years, but I never got the feeling that the, sh- despite being an overall serious tone and an actual serious story being told with that, I never got the uh, impression that the show took itself too seriously, like the writing took itself too seriously. And it actually took, uh, you know, moments here and there to let loose, let the characters be silly or funny, have little comedic gags, but then it always would rain it back in appropriately. And I feel like uh, apothecary diaries did the exact same thing. Like it's overall a serious story being told, but it's also not afraid to have fun with it's like it's setting it's, it's, uh, situations, it's characters when it's appropriate. It's, it's not le- uh, afraid to let its world breathe. Mm-hmm. Do you agree, John? Or are you just... <laughs> Why do you look like you're studying something? Oh, I'm reading. <laughs> are you reading, reading manga? No, no, no. I'm reading about Apothecary Diaries. Because I was like, I'm pretty sure this is a light novel. As um, It's based on a light novel. Oh. And I, I was just sort of like reading Wikipedia entrances. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um... Yeah, that's something with the writing that I just I, I really appreciate. It's one of the reasons I, I adore Full Metal Alchemist, and it's one of the another reason why I just adored this anime because it took that time in its writing away from being super serious to let it have fun with the story it was trying to tell. Yeah. And Especially I, every time you see Mau Mau with the cat ears, I fucking adore it. Oh my it. god. Cat girl Mau Mau best. Best yes. thing ever. And can we talk about how Aoyuki just is a phenomenal yes. voice actor. Like the oh fucking range. She does not get anywhere near. She doesn't get anywhere near enough credit as she deserves for being like the range she has as a voice actor. I mean, I think it's 
the the proof is in the pudding. Like you could definitely say like, oh, she could have fell into the um art. Uh, was it? She could have been typecasted for sure. Like, you know, like, Kuga Mia was like typecasted as like the Sundere character, and like freaking um whoever the guy who voices Dio, he always voices big buff menacing characters like Dio. He just always yeah. does. But they have they have these both of these voice actors have dynamic ranges when it comes to voice acting that they do get cast in other things. And with Aoyuki, it's like she could have been typecasted as like the typical Sundari character because she is Tatsumaki. Mm -hmm. um, but she also plays like Clementine from Overlord. Uh, she plays Tanya. Tanya, yeah. Tanya. The, well, the, yeah. the crazy. She she kind of was typecast a little bit into like the crazy bitch role. Yeah. Uh, but, I mean, I, I feel like Mao's <laughs> a little bit crazy too, but not in the sense that she'll kill us. She's not she'll probably uh, kill herself. Of, she's not, she's not yeah. crazy like in a malevolent sense. She's just crazy like a mad scientist. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah, just Aoyuki's range is phenomenal. And I, I enjoyed so much that, like, whenever I see that it's the character is going to be voiced by someone like Aoyuki, I'm like, oh, yeah, it's going to be good. At least yeah. the acting is going to be good. There's there's like a, a handful of, of Japanese voice actors that for me are a draw. Like if I see their name in the cast list, I'm like, I'm gonna check this out just to see how they do this. Absolutely. And and Aoyuki is probably one of those for me. Um, we should probably do a, a episode of the podcast about like our favorite Japanese voice actors sometime. I feel like we already have. Have we? I, we might have. I I'd have to go we? back and look. <laughs> You do a podcast for like eight years and <laughs> everything blends together. We've probably said everything that can be said about anime at this point, right? Maybe. We'll find out, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, let's actually talk about the story because uh, I I adore the story. Um, as Real quick, before we start going into that, would you guys recommend it? Oh, absolutely. I would definitely right. Like... <laughs> Everyone and their mother would recommend Apothecary Diaries. Like, Apothecary Diaries came out of fucking nowhere and started fucking swinging, dude. It was yeah. competing with the Giants at the time. It was, like, free runs airing at the exact same time, running through the exact same, like, cores. And people are still going Apothecary Diaries, Apothecary Diaries. Like, I, to me, I was like, so, I remember... Freaking! It was Chinoda going. Hey guys, Apothecaries is Apothecary Diaries is really good. You guys should watch it. And I'm just like, whatever the fuck, Chinoda. I don't care. <laughs> and then like all of a sudden, all I see online is people just talking about Free Run and Apothecary Diaries. And I'm like, okay, well, at this point, I started watching Free Run already. I'm like, okay, everyone was right. It's fucking great. I'm go watch it. Um, you should also go watch our Free Run spoiler cast if you guys want to learn more about that. You should. So a lot of I a lot like, of you have, and thank you very much. I I was uh, just like, okay, it's a Saturday. I've got nothing to watch. I guess I'll watch Apothecary Diaries. <laughs> so then I watch the first episode, and the first thing I see is like in the credits, like I'm like, oh, huh, this music design is pretty good, Kevin Pankin. I'm like, then I type in the chat, Chinoda, you fuck. <laughs> Why you did you say lead Kevin? With this? <laughs> You didn't say Kevin Peck and helped do the music on this. He's like, oh, I totally forgot. I'm like, what the hell? You also didn't say Aoyuki was voice acting in it. Like, again, things that are important to tell people about why you should watch it, maybe about the talent behind who's making it, you know, lead with that. Because yeah. the synopsis of Apothecary Diaries by itself, I was just like, a girl who likes to eat poison. And I was like, eh, whatever. And then the clips that I had seen of Apothecary Diaries at the time before I started watching it was just like, oh, it's so funny. Haha, ha, this girl likes to eat poison. It was just like weird, but okay. That's all I knew about it prior to w starting to watch it. And the fact that people were just hyping the crap out of it. It's like, it's, I think it's in at like a 4.9 on Crunchyroll and probably like an 8.5 or 8.4 or something on Mal. Uh, it is currently sitting at 8.92 on Mal. Oh my god, oh, even higher than I thought. Holy yeah. crap. It's very well loved and received. Uh, and part, Free Run's still sitting did. at a 9.39. <laughs> free Run's amazing. <laughs> it is. People, some people are like <laughs> thinking Free Run's just the new flavor of the month. And I'm like, dude, no, Free Run's, no. I free think run's here free to run's stay, gonna man. Be here. It's, but yeah, I, I would definitely recommend watching Apothecary Diaries. Because one of the things is that this is kind of feels like a show. It, I mean, it is. It's a shoujo manga, sh shoujo light novel. It's made for women. 
and girls. However, it isn't just that. I, I feel like this is a medium that, yes, it is. it has general themes of, like, being made for women. However, it can be enjoyed by all, which is the, a great thing. Yeah, you know, just like how I a mean, bunch of people no like women movies. over here. We all fucking loved it. <laughs> okay, but like we also, I like all we all. I would say I love shoujo manga. I love reading shoujo manga, so I'm a little bit biased. Like I don't care about yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's all of us still, John. <laughs> you guys never recommend me shoujo manga. Like I'm always recommending it's because you, you already read them all. You fuck. Yeah, you've already <laughs> read them all. We can't recommend anything new to you. Um. No, I, I'm I uh I was a bit of a latecomer to to this as well. Um, I didn't start watching this until like January of this year. Um, after being hounded over and over again by Chnoda, and then I watched like the first three episodes, and I went to him and said, "I see what all the excitement is about. It's good. <laughs> like off yeah. rip, it's good. Like you yeah. know how." other shows were just like oh you got to give it like six episodes you gotta you gotta watch it it's worth the investment bro like no off rip this show is fucking yeah, great like, like the episode first one episode draws you in. yeah episode one i'm just like please let me see more yeah. <laughs> like, i mean shit, this is interesting <laughs> i mean it hooked me like from the beginning because as we have discovered recently um i'm a sucker for period dramas <laughs> Um, yeah. And that's kind of what this is. I mean, it definitely does a good job encapsulating, I think, the the era, more or less, that this is supposed to be in, which confused me at first because John and I were talking about this last night. I originally thought that this this sh like show is supposed to be taking place in something like 1500s, 1600s China. No. It is. It's, no, it's, it's a fictional. Old. It's a fictional kingdom. It's a fictional kingdom based on like an old Chinese imperial kingdom, but it's based in like what's supposed to be the Tang Dynasty, which was between six forty and seven ninety A.D. Yeah, or no, nine seventy A.D. Excuse me. Still, it's pretty old. <laughs> yeah, uh, and the other thing that I found interesting, I remember making this comment back in the when i started watching i was like i find it interesting that a japanese person wrote something about a chinese period drama like yeah. that's just it's crossing borders here <laughs> it's kind of weird like I, I feel like they'd be more familiar with and probably would want to do like sengoku stuff you know like three the, the warring period in japan the feudal warring period yeah but they chose to do china for some reason i'm like maybe maybe hey, they're just a big chinese buff yeah, maybe the person that did write write this originally was actually a Chinese history buff. I don't know. Um, I, I just know a Japanese person is writing a story about Chinese history. I don't know. <laughs> Set in Chinese. Like, it's a weird setting, right? Yeah, it is. The, like, oh, and the time period, period too. too. And, and the time period is, is pretty far back in the past as well. Like, for, for example, like, if... I mean, this is two very different anime, but to compare uh, the setting that Apothecary Diaries takes place in, at least the time period, um, this is all taking place before the events of Vinland Saga. <laughs> because Vinland Saga takes place around 1015 AD. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I love that aspect of it. I, I like this whole, like, palace intrigue stuff. I like the, the mystery aspect that, that, you know, comes in where Mau Mau just plays CSI, <laughs> CSI Chinese Palace. Um, I, I love that. Um, I don't know. I'm just such a sucker for period dramas. I love it. And this definitely scratched my itch for it. <laughs> no, it, it hits that itch hard. I didn't even realize I was wanting something like this until I started watching. I'm like, yeah, this is good. So let's, uh, let's love actually historical talk. historical shows. Let's actually yeah. talk about some of the the stories that take place uh, in in this this anime. Um, spoiler warning, kids! <laughs> I mean, it's a spoiler cast. I hope they would know by now that we're gonna spoil stuff. <laughs> um, uh, I guess we'll start off from the beginning about Mau Mau getting kidnapped. I mean, the girl just gets kidnapped and said, "You work in the palace now. <laughs> this is your job." And she's like, "All right." I'll just do my time and I'll get out. John, do you want to mention the plot hole real quick? So, I mentioned this, was it yesterday? Last night. Last night while we night. were talking Last about night. this, yeah. Technically um, today. It was, was after it? midnight on the East yeah, Coast. Yeah, it was after midnight that. when oh. you joined. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I was like, you know, how did the people who kidnap the the women and sell them to the palace for a profit, they have to prove that, oh, this woman, because slavery is outright um, banned at, in this setting, as mm -hmm. we find out later. So that led me to think, like, wait, if slavery is banned and, like, you can't have illegally trade or not tr – slavery isn't banned, but um, kidnapping is, like, frowned upon or is you can't do that, right? You can't just kidnap people and sell them to the palace for Illegal. <laughs> so what was stopping all the people who do get kidnapped, like Mau Mau, from just going up to the people and being like, hey, I was kidnapped. It's not actually my family. And I'm just mm -hmm. like, you know – it doesn't really make sense. And then I was like, I kind of logiced it out. And I was like, well, back in the day, people are illiterate. You could, And then, like, how do you prove that this family registry that they used to register me as, like, I'm their daughter and they're selling me? And, and it's stuff. not a forgery. Yeah, like, it's not a forgery. Like, you wouldn't have a family registry unless you're, like, rich or part of a noble's. nobles. So that makes sense for other people. But Mau Mau is, from the start, is seen as very intelligent. So and I she feel is like... And she's literate. She can read and write, but she's like, oh, I don't want to stick out. However, the other issue I had with that was like, well, she may be smart, but she also knows that she, you know, want to keep her head down, keep keep a low profile. I don't want to draw attention. Yeah. But she's also from a, a brothel that is extremely famous in the capital, Verdigree Palace. And, yeah. And they have a and lot very of power. scale. So I'm like, well, she could prove that she's from Verdigree Palace, that she grew up there. Literally, the proprietress, the the uh, the boss on could prove that this is Mau Mau is my like adoptive daughter or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I, that didn't make any sense to me. It still doesn't make sense to me other than like, well, maybe Mau Mau just was like, Oh, I'm just going to keep my head low and just lay low. And I don't want to cause no trouble. Like maybe like, yeah, sure. I guess. I don't know. I, I just was like, it didn't make sense to me because she's so smart. She could get out of it is all I'm saying. Yeah. 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 It's not so much a plot hole as it is just a head scratcher, I guess. I mean, <laughs> aren't it's more interesting plot holes? <laughs> not well, it's more interesting of a story because she's in the palace, right? That's why she's actually there. Yeah, <laughs> she's not a character I mean, written to be like, oh, I'm just gonna be the smartest person alive. It's like, no, she just likes doing whatever. Fan like, she can't help but be a detective. <laughs> She yeah. can't help but want to, like, solve mysteries. And to be fair, I mean, being in the palace gives her access to more materials than she'd have in the outside. Yeah. Again, I just found it strange that for a girl so smart, she didn't want to... She didn't just automatically be like, hey, these guys kidnapped me and, like, screw them over because I would have yeah. done that. <laughs> like, uh, instantly. I'm like, these guys are getting paid a stipend out of what I get paid a month? No, screw that. They ain't getting a free Maybe paycheck Maybe she didn't know? I mean, we know Mau Mau's smart and all, but it's not like she knows everything. That's true. She's only really smart when it comes to solving mysteries and anything about medicine and poisons. Yeah. yeah. And as we find out later, sex. <laughs> well, yeah, she grew up in a brothel, so. Yeah. <laughs> I guess that makes sense. <laughs> that was one of my favorite things, though, when they're just sitting there teaching the concubines about sex, and they're all like, huh? I'm just, uh, Ao, Mau Mau? Not what? just sex, but, like, the, the secret techniques to pleasing a man. Yeah. 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 Um, just kind of back that up a little bit, though. So one of the things that happens uh, pretty early on when she gets to uh, the palace, besides trying to be a background character and she realizes she can't because she's too damn curious about everything, uh, that's when she meets uh, Jinshi, who is uh, one of the palace eunuchs <laughs> in giant fucking quotation marks. Um, and he immediately comes on to her. <laughs> what a fucking... Well, so Jinshi, he he does that to all the women. Yeah. Right? Because it's yeah. like, he's he's so beautiful, right? Like, Mau Mau even makes a comment, like, it wouldn't matter if it was a guy or a girl. He could make anyone fall for him. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And uh, so it seems like, it's like, automatically, he just does that to everyone. And she's just, like, unfazed. She's like, oh, really? That's interesting. And then turns around and goes away. <laughs> <laughs> and he's, he's like, like I how did it not work? <laughs> Yeah, he's like, oh, interesting. <laughs> like, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, I, 
I'm of a mixed opinion about the growing like relationship between the two because I know that the the story is kind of building up this relationship slowly between them, and I'm like. Part of me is like, yeah, go for it. And then part of me is like, I like the banter too much with them being friends. Keep them as friends so I get this fun banter. <laughs> yeah, like on top of being a, a drama, um, what else? It, is it history? Is that what it was listed as? Historical? Tags. It's, a dra- it's a mystery drama and also romance. It has three genre tags on uh, gotcha. Wikipedia. But you it's can like, almost yeah. certainly add a historical tag to it. So, yeah. It's like drama and mystery, perfect. That you know, off rip, we see that. Then the romance. Yeah. I'm just like, you know, I see that there could be a potential budding romance here, but mm. one person is clearly not interested, and the other person is like, this is kind of a passing um, infatuation at most, at the very beginning. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I would say if you go into this thinking, oh, I'm, I'm here for a really good romance, you're you're not, you're gonna have a you're rough not. time, buddy. Like yeah. this are... is this is not a romance, like outright. I will romance. say you can see them laying out the groundwork it's very slow it's very much yeah this will happen way later but i really like that aspect of it because oh yeah there's it's not what matters subtext. but yeah, yeah. but mm. the subtext and the fact that they're putting those building blocks there it's like it's gonna take a good while but i'm enjoying but, seeing it happen yeah, in slow motion it's, it's like it's like watching full metal alchemist it's like there, is there there's romance in that technically yeah. speaking oh right? yeah Absolutely. Is it a main focus ever? No. Uh, there is a romantic subtext of, involved here and there, but I I would say the primary genres of Apothecary Diaries is mystery drama. Like that's yeah. what is interesting to me the most. This is the mystery yeah. and the drama. And it's the like intrigue. I, it, yeah, it's, it's like I was mentioning to you last night. Like in the first season of, of this show, the stories take on one of three different context it is either palace intrigue which is usually instigated by either the concubines jinshi or the emperor um you have the uh the mystery aspect which is uh something crazy happens mal mal comes in to investigate and then toward the end you have the family drama stuff with mal mal's father like those are the three types of stories that you get throughout this entire first season. It's not a complex setup. It's very easy to understand, which is why I think it's something I have no problem recommending to anyone, even people who aren't particularly anime fans. Um, Actually, but it does no. make for some good storytelling. Yeah, like <laughs> Apothecary Diaries is it's an anime, but it doesn't have like anime bullshit that's going on. Yeah, it's except just, for the it's cat just, ear stuff. Well, that's just like reaction it has a... stuff. Yeah, it has some uh, tropes here and there, but overall, it's a lot more digestible, and you can you can re- easily recommend this to casuals, honestly. Now, I wanted to ask John about something in particular because I've talked about this with Chinoda. Um, so, to kind of it, it, this is jumping ahead a little bit, but halfway through the run of this first season, we get confirmation that Jinshi is in fact not a eunuch. Um, and is taking like these libido suppressors. He's taking like medicine that's a libido suppressor, and that is it's hinted at early on in this in this show. I think it's hinted at as early as episode two, where Jinji like just casually approaches Mao Mao. It's like, hey girl, you know how to make any of those aphrodisiacs? <laughs> and I thought when that happened, it's like this is kind of setting up that he's not actually a eunuch. But I thought, mm, is this a red herring? Is he actually just gay? I that's ha- that's what I thought. So, because I've watched so many, like because of the whole romance thing, I was like, all right, it's gonna end up being that he actually works for the inner palace, and he's actually like a guy. He's stationed here for some reason, for or another. Like either it's his whimsy, or it was the order of the emperor. So mm-hmm. that's that was my initial thought of like. Okay, dude's probably not a eunuch, and he's probably like an actual guy guy mm. uh, that can be here in the rear palace without being a eunuch. And it's because like because of main main storyline reasons later on that we'll get into. Yeah. But he falls in love with the, this particular girl who has a particular set of skills. I thought that was going to be the original setup. Uh, as it turns out, uh, I wasn't that far off. He yeah. is being positioned there. We do learn that later on that he he was told by the emperor to tend to his flower garden to make sure like he it literally the the emperor literally put Jingxi there because he's like I want you to be there because you're hot 
and I want you to weed out all the people and tell me who's the girls that would betray me for you. And I'm just like, but why? See, like, why? so that so that question get, does get answered, but then it's like, it's a good but setup. Why? It's a good setup. It's a really it's good a very setup. good setup. Yeah. I mean, so is the thing with him wanting the aphrodisiac because it puts that doubt in your mind as the viewer. It's like, is he really a eunuch? <laughs> I was, I just, for some reason, when the first time I saw that, I'm like, this seems like it's a red herring to, to throw us off. So, as Alex said, we already talked about this uh, earlier, but, like, I picked up on it immediately. I was like, he's no eunuch. I was like, he, he's someone important, too. Like, yeah, right? Because, because, from how well anime... manicured, how beautiful he is, yeah, how like with, intelligent with... he is, like, I was like, this is someone that matters. Like, He's going to have a whole lot of lore about him. Listen, his character design is too complex to be a side character. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, really. He's so beautiful. One hundred. <laughs> Listen, when that much effort goes into designing a character, you know they're going to keep him around. You don't design a character that well to put him in two scenes. <laughs> That would be the ultimate red herring, honestly. <laughs> that genuinely, yes, it would. L if, listen, if you really want to throw out a really good red herring manga artist, create the most beautiful character design you've ever seen, only shows up in one chapter. <laughs> like, there is, um, what is it? Main character energy. That's what this is called. Like, Jinshi yeah. has main character energy. Oh, yeah. yeah very true. Very true. Uh, but yeah, I also was like, and then also in like typical, um, anime bullshit fashion, I was just like, okay, well, he's got a relation to the inner palace. So I automatically assume like, oh, he's probably the prince or something. And he's doing this on a whim. Like that, yeah. that was in my other, like, this is what else is happening on top of being that, told that by the emperor. That was literally Dangers. my exact thought as right? well, actually, yeah, when I was watching it. Yeah, because it's like, well, there's a romance tag and there's drama and mystery. And I'm like, off of first episode, I'm like, that's probably what's going to happen. Um, again, not far off. <laughs> no. <laughs> Surprisingly, not far off guesses, but... No. Um, and I, I also like that, like, the first, um, or one of the first um, things that Mao Mao ends up getting assigned to once she starts working under, like, Jinshi in the, in the outer palace, right? Um, she becomes after she finds out the poisonous makeup thing, which also sets in, in, in into uh, effect a, a chain of events that kind of snowballs into a much larger conspiracy. No, uh, no, no, no. Jingxi works in the rear palace. That's where the. Yeah. it's just that. The, the, so but the rear she's palace. She's in the outer is, palace. Yeah. No, no, no. She's in the rear palace still. Oh. So originally she was in the um, outer palace. Now she's in the rear palace. Perfectly. Yes, yes. I, yeah, I mixed that up. I, I mixed that up. I got I got that backwards. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um it, it all sounds so similar. I'm not used to all these terms. Um but no, like the poisonous makeup thing, uh, where she finds out that the the makeup that the concubines are using, um, not only to cover their face, but also on their children, uh their babies, is poisonous. It's probably lead lined, which is not good. <laughs> it's yeah, probably so... lead poisoning. The it's like Mau Mau uh grew up in the uh brothels, so she knows like there's courtesans and stuff and um mm -hmm. prostitutes that would use makeup to make themselves look better, but it also would kill them slowly. And so she recognizes all the symptoms of like lead poisoning. She's like, Oh my god, there's lead poisoning happening here. So yeah. uh she she realizes that because the two concubines that uh have children were both getting really sick. Yeah, and she against her better nature of trying to lay low and not stir any trouble because you know most people can't read or write, so she's just like, well, I I can't explain to them that I was kidnapped and I'm I'm actually like knowledgeable and stuff, so I'm just gonna leave a random like note to both of these concubines to, to warn them about like, hey, there's lead in that, stop using it and your baby won't die. So yeah. there's pink girl and blue girl. Uh, I don't remember their names. <laughs> <laughs> uh Gokyo and um Is it Li Lihao? Li Lihaku? Uh, li Lihaku? I cannot no, I Lihaku the is the guard. No, I don't I don't know What's the names. Hold on. Who is the blue haired um, uh Lihua? Lihua is the uh Lihua, blue haired yeah. uh concubine. Yeah. Lihua and uh Gyokyo. <laughs> so Gyokyo is the pink one, Lihua is the blue one. 
Um, I will continue to refer to them as pink and blue because I listen. Don't. I this is exactly how I remember them too. There's there's pink, there's blue, there's purple, and then there's child. I remember Adua. Adua was an easy one to remember. Yeah, she's the one with the purple hair. Well, uh, I thought she was child. <laughs> out of the four concubines that we meet in the uh, rear palace, I'm like the most interesting was Adula's storyline, in my opinion. <laughs> like I, I could give less of a rat's ass about a uh, pink or blue or child. Like I'm like I don't care about your storylines, but Adula's storyline, I was like, oh, that breaks my heart, bro. <laughs> Like, I yeah, love Adua. Do, do you want to talk? No I mean, I, I know we're kind of going out of order, but if you want to talk about it, go right ahead because I love it too. Yeah. No, no, we can. Uh, so, no, no, we we can just go like in the beginning. So, like, Mao Mao like writes the note like, "Hey, stop using lead." So, Pink Girl reads it and goes, "All right, I'll try it." And as it turns out, it works. She's not dying no more, and her kid's not dying no more. Yeah. Uh, Blue hair was like, "The fuck is this?" And doesn't care. So this comedy child... don't own me. Yeah. yeah. Her child dies, and she ends up hella sick. Sick. Yeah, and so then um, people try to figure out, or Jinshi figures out, like, who the fuck solved this mystery? Who who could have done that? What mysterious letter did Pink Girl get and listen to? Who is this? And quite literally, <laughs> the funniest thing is that he uses her uh, Mau Mau's wits and smartness against her. <laughs> yeah. Where, like, he gets all of the people who were seen near that area where the notes were found uh, into a room. And he holds up a sign that says, if you can read this, uh, then stay in the room or whatever. And, every and then he tells everyone to, like, leave. And then she's, like, the only person who he knew she, she could read. And he's like, all right, so you're not illiterate. So you must be the one who wrote this. And she's like, damn it. <laughs> Yeah, you know, for someone so smart, Mao Mao, you're still pretty dumb at times, you know. <laughs> she fell like, for this it, the, like mm. the most obvious trap. Yeah, um, which I mean, at the time like this is supposed fiddle. to be, at the time this is supposed to be taking place. I mean, not only was it unusual for a woman to be literate, it was unusual for no, a, a lot of people. Period. To be literate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh. So yeah, Jingxi hatches this, the master plan to catch Mao Mao, and he's like, "All right, I need you to explain to me how the fuck you knew that." And she's like, "Okay, actually, I'm at, I used to be a, an apothecaryist. Uh, I was kidnapped." And he's like, "Oh, yeah. Well, can you prove it?" And she's like, "Not really." He's like, "All right, well, that means we can't do anything, but whatever. That doesn't matter." So, yeah. um, because of that, it's like, "All right, well, you saved Pink Girl, but why is Blue Girl still dying?" So then Mao Mao, like, goes and figures out, like, why Blue Girl is dying. As it turns out, her head retainer, Blue Girl's head retainer, was still putting the lead makeup on Blue Girl. So she was against still dying. Her, like, against her wishes, too, I think. Well, after Blue Girl's uh, son dies, or kid dies, I don't remember if they talked about the gender or not. I think it was a boy, but... The baby. After, Blue, the, after the baby passes, uh, Blue Girl just, like, doesn't want to live anymore, so she doesn't really care. Yeah, like, whatever happens into happens. a deep depression. Yeah, it makes sense. So then uh, Mau Mau, like, is now assigned to go, um, she was assigned to help Pink Girl at first because Pink Girl was, like, thankful that Mau Mau's advice saved her kid. Yeah. And, you know, she's now in the rear palace instead of working as a, I believe she was a, a clothing person? She was a laundry, a, a laundry, laundry of some kind. Yeah, laundry, a laundry yeah. washer or whatever. Now she's, a, like, one of the uh, rear palace kind of maids, kind of not maids. I don't. Attendance. Assistance? No, she was a food She's tester. A lady in yeah. waiting. Oh yeah, she becomes a food tester. Yeah. Um, yeah. And she's just, and this is where we first learn like my mouth's fucking crazy. She likes eating poison. Because <laughs> all the girls are like, oh, we feel so sorry for her. And she's like, is it poisoned? <laughs> it's not poison. I like, I like how I, I like poison. how like I I love how anytime she ends up tasting or like getting exposed to poison she's like she almost has, has most, an orgasmic experience. This most blissful <laughs> orgasmic face possible. <laughs> like yeah, bitch like, you crazy. I, I love the character faces and expression that Mao Mao makes like then when she mm. goes cat ear mode and stuff like yeah. <laughs> it's mm. like <laughs> it's so cute. Uh, yeah, so she helps out Pink Girl, and turns out that she wasn't bullshitting Jingxi. She actually was an apothecaryist. Apothecaryist? Apothecary? apothecary? She was an apothecary. And uh, she actually knows what the fuck she's talking about with her poisons, because he tests her again. It's like, 
they serve all the stuff in the wrong things that help detect poison. So she gives like advice, like, yeah, if you want to detect poison, you should probably serve this in silver. You should do this. You should do that. And they're just like, oh shit. All right, she's real. She she ain't playing us. She's actually like real no shit. No. And then she gets assigned to go save Blue Girl, and then we learn about all the other stuff. Direct and request by the Emperor, mind you. Yeah. Yeah, because like the Emperor's like, who saved Pink Girl? Can you save Blue Girl? So. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that whole like detoxing Liwa thing was was quite the um, emotional experience because you find out that one of her ladies in waiting is still like putting that makeup on despite you know being told and maybe even knowing that it's probably the wrong thing to do. He's like, I mean, no, I'm just doing it anyway. <laughs> I wouldn't even account. I wouldn't even attribute that to be people being ignorant back in the 600s. Like people are doing that shit like that today. So, True. hey, this thing is bad for you, and it's like yeah right <laughs> <laughs> i mean you're not wrong you, you, you're not wrong um can i also talk about something that happens that i thought was upon further reflection i like it more than when i first watched it um and that's the whole uh one of the uh concubines the Fu fuyo uh yeah. like dancing on top of the wall the, the whole ghost uh story uh, incident like when i first watched them like all right I, I get it this is yeah I, I get what you're going for the presentation is a little bit whatever but i get it but now on, upon further reflection i'm like no this is actually really really good i think the story it told was very well done i didn't particularly care for it i was like all right it's whatever it but was I mean, mostly if you think just about a it, show in the in the it's time this is in the time this is supposed to be going on, you know, women don't have a lot of autonomy, but her trying to get her way by pretending to be mentally ill and undesirable to the emperor, it's actually kind of genius. Oh, no, it's an yeah, extremely it a smart brain. way to do it. Yeah. <laughs> but also, um, I'm not sure if you guys noticed it, but it was also foreshadowing. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was foreshadowing. I didn't realize it at the time. Yeah, no, I mean, I didn't realize it at the time until we get to that's, the freaking um, um, her that's what good mom and dad is. story, and I'm just like, oh my god, they they set it up perfectly. I was like, this yeah. story that was kind of just like, hey, it's one of the other mysteries that she can solve. And it's just like, oh, I thought it was more of like telling you about the background about like the concubines and stuff like that. And I'm like, I have yeah. a general knowledge of what six hundred six hundred AD China would be like, so I understand what this all means. Like I've seen because I I watch Chinese dramas and stuff too. Like I like Chinese movies and dramas. So I'm not unfamiliar with these type of things. Yeah. But um, that's what I uh, chalked it up to. I didn't realize it was actually foreshadowing until we get to the end of the Apothecary Diary season. And I was like, yeah. oh, my God, they set it up way early on to let us know. Like, oh, wow, that's pretty good. Yeah. It just the idea that a woman to try and get her way is just going to fake a mental illness to, to get what she wants to become undesirable. It's like, yeah, if I were a woman, that'd probably be something I'd try back then. <laughs> Yeah, uh, instead of like, instead of laying down and taking it, uh, quite literally, because yeah, as a concubine, she's, well, she was sold off, uh, as a into the rear palace because it's like, oh, she's the most beautiful dancer or something in the village, yeah, yeah. and she's supposed to be like this amazing dancer, and then it's like they talk about her story. She's like, yeah, uh, on her first seeing night of seeing the emperor where she was supposed to dance for him, she fucking trips and biffs it. <laughs> 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 and now it's like oh she's clumsy as fuck so she's actually not that great of a dancer she was hyped mm -hmm. up or whatever and everyone's feeling sorry for her it's like yeah she didn't make a good impression on the emperor because you gotta understand the emperor has like we we have the four concubines that we see in the um that we are, are surrounded by around with mao mao but there are more than four. Oh yeah um back in the day like emperors could have somewhere up to like hundreds of concubines just because yeah, two three hundred it, it, yeah. it's better for them because one they're the emperor they rule everything so they kind of own everyone but also because they it's easier to get a son that way you know yeah. if i had 70 different partners i could one of them eventually will be a son <laughs> yeah not to just mention, statistically you, speaking not to mention you have to realize the amount of babies that died in the first couple of years like there's a reason why oh, some yeah. people didn't even name their kids the first couple of years because who knows if the baby was going to survive? Infant mortality was what... a bigger deal back then. Yeah, it was yeah. huge. Yeah. Um, 
Also, I want to talk about the garden party because that sets off some shenanigans. The uh, so the garden party. First of all, we found out that the uh, in that that Mau Mau's freckles aren't real. She paints them on all the time. Yeah, and like that's when you see like yeah no this world is actually pretty dark because she's like yeah no I want uh I want it as a deterrent for would be rapists uh and it's like yeah no that makes complete and perfect sense like dark as fuck but yeah no yeah understandable uh, to to say the least um but yeah one hundred percent makes sense but in all the whole thing with the garden party also that um Lisu which is the child uh concubine. Um, her ladies in waiting are a total bitch to her. <laughs> They're not bitches. Bitch. They are bullies. They are straight up bullies. These, these they they so they act so like jealous and, and shitty towards her, and it's like, God, I'd be so depressed <laughs> if that were the people that were my attendants. Um, then we also find out in that that uh, number one, she's allergic to mackerel, and they try and feed it to her. Um, which John was talking about it last night, and I didn't realize this. In a lot of Asian cultures back then, and apparently still to this day, like if you're allergic to something, it's like, no, you're not. Just get over it. <laughs> yeah, that's, the, that's so the attitude. One of Even. the unfortunate things about like being Asian in general is that a lot of Asian people don't think allergies exist. Like this is not unique to like um like a specific Asian person, I would say, because this is I see in a lot of different Asian cultures, like Eastern or Southeast Asians even like um, Pacific Islanders and stuff, allergies don't exist, bro. They don't. Mm. Like, <laughs> quite literally, my mom, my wife is allergic to um, coconuts, like deathly allergic to coconuts, and my mom tried to feed her a little bit of coconut. And I'm like, Mom, she will literally fucking die. Don't. <laughs> She's like, what? And I'm like, yes, it's that bad. And she's like, I don't think so. Are you sure? And I'm like, yes, if you feed her coconut, we will go to the hospital and we're going to have to pay money. <laughs> she's like... <laughs> The second okay. biggest fear. <laughs> yeah, the second biggest fear for Asians, paying money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, that is the biggest fear. That's that's how you get them to not do shit. It'll cost you money. They're like, oh, no, we can't do it then. No. <laughs> yeah, you but, give me uh, discount? In, <laughs> like, for one thing, if people go to Japan, like, if you want to ever go to Japan uh, and you are a picky eater or you have allergies, just let it be known that they don't actually – a lot of outside of the main cities they do not cater to things like that if there yeah. are foods that you can't eat or don't want to eat it is seen as rude if you say no thank you even yeah. if it would kill you uh, also uh, uh if you don't like seafood and you go to japan you're gonna have a bad time yeah, they, they <laughs> yeah eat a no, bunch really. of seafood. but uh that's just that's just something that happens so that's why um child concubine is being bullied because it's like oh she's a child she's a picky eater she just doesn't want to eat this food and as it turns out she's actually just allergic <laughs> she, yeah she gets uh hives and itchy and her throat swells up and stuff when she eats it she has, so she doesn't she has learned to not like it <laughs> yeah because she knows which, that when she eats this her mouth gets prickly yeah um, which is one of that, the signs that you might be allergic to something by the way if you eat something and it's spicy it's <laughs> it's not supposed to be spicy like i i, I remember seeing uh, a guy write something like i learned i was allergic to peanuts today or peanuts and peanut butter and it's like yeah i always thought that peanut butter was spicy as it turns out peanut butter is not spicy <laughs> i just i'm allergic just allergic to it. <laughs> <laughs> and i'm like bro how do you live 18 years of your life and not know that <laughs> well there's a lot of thing common things people don't talk about so like when you discover well, it you're you know, like what's funny what? is that i i was like that too because so uh when i was a kid i was allergic to eggplant and mm. again, Asian family, we don't believe in allergies. So whenever we would eat eggplant, I'd be like, yeah, my mouth is kind of itchy. And they're like, whatever, shut up, just eat the eggplant. So I just kept eating it. <laughs> I was allergic <laughs> to eggplant as a child. <laughs> Eventually, I, I guess because I, uh, one of the new theories and one of the new studies finds out that to actually combat allergies, you actually, if you have a mild exposure to something, you just have to keep exposing yourself to it as a child to actually raise your immunity to it. So, so that's actually therapy. Correct. Yes, yeah, that actually, therapy, yeah. that is, that used to be like, oh, that's fake news, this and that. Apparently, that's actually what you're supposed to do. Like, the reason why there's so many peanut allergies nowadays is because a lot of people find out that their children are mildly allergic to something, like peanuts, one of the most common allergies. So they stop giving them peanuts. It's like, no, you can't do that. If you do that, it would develop into a more severe allergy. Yeah. 
Uh, huh. It's also worth noting that as you as you get older, you can develop new allergies too. Yeah, you can develop tolerances, and you can also develop allergies. Like my buddy, he used to not be allergic to shellfish. He's allergic to shellfish now, which sucks. Yeah, it, it's funny um, because his family always was like crabbing and um stuff so he would always have shellfish as a kid but now it's like if he wants shellfish he has to like pop a freaking um allergy pill beforehand if he wants to eat it and not get swelly like swelling oh, and itchy that and sucks stuff. so much i yeah i know i'm like pop a benadryl before i ate some seafood like i couldn't bro i would <laughs> i love seafood so much but uh yeah if you're a picky eater you got allergies like you got to learn uh if especially if you're going to go places outside of like the big cities a lot of people are not very accommodating and asian culture just in general is not accommodating yeah. honestly to, this to isn't with this isn't just japan this isn't just asian no. culture this is the whole world <laughs> yeah i also no I here didn't... in america i would say that a lot of people are, are more sensitive to allergen info well yeah yeah and in just the allowing west people in general. to be picky yeah i guess outside of picky, america people. I don't know Europe. I feel like the West in general is is more tolerant of that kind of, of stuff. Uh, depending is. where you go, depending Maybe. where you go. I will say though, recently I have developed a new allergy that was quite distressing. Wait, what? I I have developed an allergy to a medication, and they put me on it, and I didn't realize I had developed the allergy to it. Oh shit! Oh. I, I I have developed an allergy to an antibiotic called ciprofloxacin, and they put me on it the last time I got a um. Uh, diverticulitis flare up and oh my god i felt like my entire body was on fire <laughs> oh that sounds miserable yeah i took it and my my inside of my body felt like it was on fire i started itching all over my body i broke out into hives it was not pretty uh -uh, yeah fortunately no. i'm not allergic to anything that i know of for now or at least uh, everything that i eat so, so now I'm, I'm i have to remember <laughs> anytime i go to the doctor or if i ever go to the emergency room i have to lead with i am allergic to ciprofloxacin you cannot give me that antibiotic <laughs> you know what's funny though like <laughs> i'm such a uh if, if it doesn't kill me i'll soldier on <laughs> <laughs> this type of guy that even if i took a medicine that gave me a mild reaction i'd be like ah yeah whatever i have extra diarrhea who cares <laughs> i would never know i'm actually allergic because no. it's like I, it didn't kill me so it's fine I legit... it's just a normal side effect whatever no, sure john you would have gone to the hospital i legit felt like my insides were on fire <laughs> I don't know, bro. You don't know. <laughs> I was literally throwing up blood, and I didn't go to the hospital for like a week. So, like, John built maybe. different. <laughs> John really is built different. And by that, I mean falling apart. <laughs> I'm, be I'm hardly being built at all. Held together by duct tape and glue. Hope some Anyways, prayer, back, back to the back apothecary to the, diaries. Back to the apothecary diaries, and not talking about us falling apart. Um, so the whole thing with the garden party, kind of, and and Lishu's like. Uh, meal getting poisoned by her getting fed something they knew that she was allergic to um kind of leads into some other shenanigans because we find out that what was being served to her was not supposed to be served to her it was actually supposed to be served to pink girl and that leads us into uh csi mal mal where she does like literal forensic pathology stuff by yeah, adjusting for fingerprints does. Which I found to be cool as shit. Oh, it was really cool and all. I'm like, but this is like a thousand years before fingerprint analysis. What are you going to do with that information, girl? It's then like I find out. 1,300 years before Aphis, yeah. Almost 1,400 yeah. years, actually, before Aphis. Uh, and I'm <laughs> but, like... Uh, I, I don't know about the historical accuracy of people using fingerprint um, techniques. Like, mm -hmm. maybe it was around in the 600s. I don't know. I, I mean, I, you I mean, could certainly to me it didn't use matter. it. It's like whatever. You could, you could use it to find out, I guess, if someone touched something, which is how she ends up using it. She uses it to figure out that four different people touched this, not necessarily like identifying those people through the fingerprints, but seeing four different fingerprints or four different sets of fingerprints. So she figures out that four different people touched this bowl that had the food that was served to uh, the concubines before it got to them. So one of those four people was the one that poisoned it. Yeah. I like I thought that was cool. Like, you know, using this deductive reasoning and stuff to to figure out that number one, something was amiss, and then trying to find out who had the opportunity to do it. No, it was actually a really interesting uh way of how she did it and how everyone watched her do it, like, oh shit. <laughs> 
No, the most uh, funniest thing was when she tastes it and it's like her freaking face is all in bliss. Like, mm. and you think it might be really good? And she's like, this is poison. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> Mama, what? <laughs> <laughs> uh i also like how when, when that happens at the garden party right she like she tastes it she does a mm, and then she just immediately runs off stage <laughs> to throw up uh uh so and then we get to like like the middle part of of this season right and that's when mal mal gets uh uh has like that leave of absence whatever and goes back to the the brothel right yeah, she yeah. finally gets to go back to Verdigree because during the um the tea party or whatever, the um there was this whole exchanging of hair, hair ornaments, pins. Hair, hair pins. Ornaments. Yeah, hair pins. And yeah. apparently what it is, I I I honestly don't even remember why they were exchanging hair pins other than like you give it to whoever you favor. And I'm just like, "Okay, what does that mean?" It's like, "Oh, whoever tickles your fancy, you can just give it to them and you yeah. can use it to like invoke a favor." And I'm like, yeah. oh, okay, but why would anyone like trade hairpins to like servants? It, it, whatever. I was like, whatever. Um, I mainly was like, whatever, because I was like, all right, Jinxie at this point is like infatuated with Mao Mao, so he's like, oh my yeah. god, like I want her. She's she's smart. She's a like great girl. She knows all these things. And then, but then the one that didn't make sense to me was the soldier guy. Like, why did he felt bad for Mao Mao, so he gave her a, a hairpin so she could call in a favor? <laughs> I mean, it worked out for him. Well, he it was giving hairpins out, hair out uh, to a lot of people. Yeah, but it was more of a as a formality of like, oh, I'm also generous. I will give favors. But as it turns out, like, even though you have a hairpin, meaning I favor you, it doesn't mean you can call in a favor. It's like, what do I get in return? Because mm. she, she calls in the favor and he's just like, what do I get in return? Like, do you not understand that if you're calling in a favor from me, like you have to offer me something of value and who are you? And I'm just like, well, that's kind of an asshole move then. Don't you think? But I mean, it pays off for him because she's yeah. like, I want to go to the Verdigree palace and I can get you a discount. And he's like, real shit. With one of the three princesses. And she's like, yes. And then he <laughs> proceeds to fall in love with one of them. <laughs> Bro, he did Oh man. Fall in love. Hard. Man, imagine falling in love with a prostitute. Man down bad for real. Well, to be fair, the these aren't just normal prostitutes. So No. Um the oldest profession in the world is prostitution because yeah. uh, you know, kings back in the day also had like you had training. Like you couldn't just be like an inexperienced man. So a lot of like princes and stuff would <laughs> have sex with these high ranking courtesans who would teach him techniques like how to please a woman so that way mm -hmm. you know you 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 as a king with 200 concubines you gotta at least make sure it's pleasurable for the women all right yeah like you if you're gonna have multiple part if, if you're gonna like have multiple partners you should at least be satisfying most of them if not all of them right like yeah don't be a selfish lover so not to mention if word gets out uh that you're a bad lover that actually takes a hit to your social reputation, which can actually damage other things as well. Yeah, like, you're supposed to be this ruling class monarchy person or high-ranking noble person, so you're supposed to be, like, the best of the best. You're the cream of the crop. So, yeah. yeah. So, but uh, with this uh, being the oldest profession, right, uh, the high-ranking courtesans are seen like, yes, they're, they're courtesans, they're, they're prostitutes, because you can, you can pay money to have sex with these people. However... They are also uh, the high ranking ones are knowledgeable. Not only are they beautiful, but they're also knowledgeable in things and literate because a lot of courtesans back in the day, they wouldn't just be people you had sex with. They were people who could hold conversations with you play games, Where high ranking them. officials and stuff in like government and businesses would hold meetings and stuff in in brothels with these women serving them because they knew how to keep a secret. Uh, they knew how to, like, converse and talk about, like, trades and market values and stuff. They knew when to shut up. They knew when to speak. They knew how to entertain you. They they weren't just someone you had sex with. They were an entertainer. Yeah. They were, like, like a full uh, encompassing entertainer. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, yeah it's, it's worth pointing that out because, like, we think of a prostitute today as just someone you give them money, you have sex with them, and then it's done. Yeah, it's not like that. It's, it's, it's not, not like as... that anymore. It's not as cut and dry transactional as we think it is, because you were you were like literally you were literally paying for their time back then. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, you <laughs> still are. You still are. Like, 
escort services still exist to this day. Like, oh, it hasn't yeah. changed. It's been 1,600 years, and it has not changed. Um, no. <laughs> but I don't think escorts. there's I don't think there's an escort service today that provides quite the same types of services that they were providing back then. Well, maybe so there, are. there is there is so for a lot of the escort services that we have here, at least in the U.S., because I don't know how it is anywhere else. Like for one thing, prostitution is supposed to be illegal in in the U.S. Um, it's not illegal everywhere in the sense that sex work is not banned everywhere in every state there are varying degrees to it but basically what an escort service is is you pay x amount of money like 500 dollars an hour for this pretty girl to come out on a date with you whether or not that leads to sex is completely up to the girl uh do most escorts sleep with their uh clients 100 percent. yeah and they'll like get friendly with you they'll they'll get your number and like text you and try to keep you like trying to get them to go out on dates because turn again, you into a regular yeah, yeah repeat you're, customer. You're, you're charging them five hundred dollars an hour. Like, if I spend three hours with you, two hours for a nice time at a nice restaurant for dinner, and then if I have to have sex with you for like an hour, I'm making fifteen hundred bucks. Like, that's an insane amount of money. And yeah, the people for a who single want night's to do this, work. Yeah, and it's like, so it's again, the, the courtesan business has not died down. It, it's still alive no. and well. So yeah. I just wanted to preface all of that because they're not just prostitutes, even though it's yeah. a brothel. It is, I mean, it, but it, it's a good thing. It's a good thing to point out. I, I completely forgot where I was going with the original statement I made, though. <laughs> um, uh, oh, uh, so when she, yeah, uh, Mao Mao gets like that leave of absence, and then she goes and stays with her her father, who is not her real father. It's uh, the uncle dude that taught her how to be an apothecary. Um, yeah, we find out later. Um, they don't say who he is, but. We they find out that it's her granduncle. Yeah, it, it's her her granduncle, her gruncle. Yeah. But I think she, I, I want to say she calls him dad or father at some. No, point. No, she calls him her father. No, yeah, but it's not dad. like it's not literally her father. We yeah. find she was out who her father by is later. Him, yeah, yeah, the man who raised her, not the man who is related to her. <laughs> well, no, he uh, is related to her. Well, he is related. Yeah, not as a father though. You know no, what I mean. Not... You know what I mean. Yes. Yes. Um, but this is when that whole thing happens where, uh, other child from brothel comes and knocks on the door and say, Hey, we, we need a doctor at the, the, the brothel. Come follow me. Um, uh, and that's when she saves the, the prostitute, uh, courtesan and the client that, that she was with. And that leads into a whole nother mystery because that was a poisoning as well. Yeah, of course. It was a <laughs> short and sweet thing, and I feel like this one didn't matter too much. Um, but no, that's yeah. also when we get to see uh, Mao Mao's mother for the first yeah, time. Yeah, for the first time. Um, and she's uh, quite syphilitic. Uh, she's got she's got the syphilis really, really bad, uh, yeah. and she's like stuck in bed. She's all, I, more or less mute. Uh, she doesn't really talk. Um, her mind and, is definitely gone. And when she goes and visits her, like she almost seems to have disdain for Mao Mao. And which really confused me if that's supposed to be your mother. But then we find out why that is later oh, on. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. It's such a when when this it's story a tragic arc story. This, yeah. yeah. When the story arc finally resolves for like Mao Mao's mother and like her family stuff. I'm just like, bro, I didn't see any of this fucking coming. And I'm no. like, oh, my God, it was so good. Holy no. crap. Um, I mean, there was questions I had as well about that ending, and I'll, I'll talk about it when we eventually get there. But, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I I don't know why they showed the, the poisoning instance happening with the uh, the prostitute and the the As an excuse to get her back at the brothel, I guess. Well, it was just like uh, – I, I felt like it was just more world-building because what happened was this uh, – the, the courtesan was supposed to be bought out by the um the son of a merchant a wealthy very wealthy yeah. merchant yes but what he did was pretend that he was going to buy her out just to like curry like to make everyone else like not use like want to ask for her because like oh she's gonna get bought out so whatever like get this and that and then he at the end he, he just goes nah i'm not gonna buy her bro <laughs> so it, it like because of that it devalues her as a um courtesan because now she's worth less and she's pissed off about it so they like so she concocts this plan to get back at the guy 
which is I drink half poison, he drinks full poison, and he'll die. Um, unfortunately, Mao Mao, the genius, is here, so she saves both of them. <laughs> well, one of them was never in life-threatening danger, but the other one was saved. Yeah. So it was very unfortunate that Mao Mao existed because, as it turns out, that um, that young girl working at that uh, at the brothel knew that the doctor wasn't in but unfortunately for her her uh or his uh the original apothecary guy his grandniece was there and she's just as good as him yeah well i wouldn't say she's just as good as him because he she no. states multiple times that he's way smarter than she is when it comes to this yeah but she's really good yeah yeah and then so shortly after all this happens, when Mao Mao goes back to uh, the palace, we have that whole thing with uh, the concubine Aldo, and that's like with the honey stuff. Oh my god, that was like like five D chess was, going on with that shit. This was one of the best storylines of the entire uh, series. Of, yeah, it was uh, my second favorite story arc here. The Adua thing was like, first of all, like the whole uh, arc behind Adua. Like I, I like her as a person, as a concubine, because like. She eventually gets released from being a concubine, and she's just like, fuck it. Man clothes, warrior clothes, jump up on this thing, start drinking some fucking alcohol. I'm like, yeah. that's my girl. <laughs> she's a literally, badass. <laughs> literally just Finn is a concubine. It's fine. <laughs> but I, yeah, it's, it's like, uh, as it turns out, um, the emperor, was it the miss, the um, emperor's wife? The main yeah. wife or whatever? Yeah. Uh, Empress the Dowager is what she's called. The is Empress call... Dowager? Is... Empress know. Dowager, which is like, uh, uh, I guess the British ex uh, British equivalent would be a queen consort to a king. So this queen consort uh, and Adua were apparently having children at the exact same time. And uh, as it turns out, like there was complications with the birth birthing process so uh the they we find out that the doctor that was sent to go save the um the consort's son like gets punished because he couldn't do it and we find out like that's actually uh mao mao's dad or her grunkle and it was like yo what like he used to work in the palace like what because he was a eunuch, and we learned that he was a eunuch. And it's like, why would a, a pharmacist be a or apothecary doctor? A doctor, because he wasn't even an apothecary guy. He was an he was an actual doctor. Yeah. Why would a doctor be a eunuch? And as it turns out, it's because he, he's being punished because of the whole the emperor situation, where the he lets the kid die. Which that's a hell of a twist. Yeah. That was a hell of a twist. I was not. I did not see that one coming. <laughs> Did we? Did any of you also see coming the fact that that I mean I guess we've kind of talked about it already that um because this is sort of where this starts to come out that uh, Jinshi is the emperor's son. I mean, as I said earlier, always suspected something was up. I didn't, or I should say, son of the previous emperor, not the current one. Yeah, he's the son of the previous emperor, not yeah. the current one. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we I guess we kind of talked about the fact that it definitely seems like he's set up to be someone special. I didn't realize he was going to be that special. <laughs> yeah, I, I I assumed in the first episode, like, he's probably like a prince or something. A prince mm -hmm. of the kingdom. But as yeah. it turns out, like, I mean, technically he's not a prince. He's the son of a concubine. Yeah. Of the last emperor. So technically he has rights to the throne if everyone else would freaking die off, but... Like, I don't know the whole hierarchical structure of, like, who the current emperor is in relation to the rest. Like, if he's the true son or not compared to Jingxi. Yeah. Don't know. Well, and then you also have the whole thing going on with um, uh, Aldo's baby, right? Got fed the honey by one of Aldo's uh, ladies-in-waiting, Fen Ming. Um, first of all, don't ever do that to a child. If, if you have a baby... Who's younger than one year old? Do not feed them honey ever. Speaking of allergies, <laughs> yeah. Uh, actually, it's not an allergy. So, uh, for people who don't know, because you just don't know, uh, babies under the age of one year, twelve months, do not have a good enough immune system and bio bio biodiversity in their gut yeah. to actually eat honey. Honey will give them botulism. A bacteria will fester and grow in their intestines and kill the baby. Do not and it's not a pleasant honey. way to die. It is a very painful in way fact, to die. And and again, it's not 
It's not just like regular honey. Anything with honey in it cannot be fed to babies. All right. Yes. Do not flavor your shit and give it to a baby under the age of one. Even, even honey then, graham like, crackers will kill them. Yes, it will. Yeah. Um, but the, I think it's like you were saying it's like two, right? Most your parents were telling you like two or three. Well, that's when you yeah, getting, I've getting I've always honey. been told by both my parents and from a couple of doctors that I've known that they they suggest over two years old. Yeah, I feel like that's, <laughs> I mean, better safe than sorry. Like I don't want to. Yeah. I don't want dead kid. It would mm. fuck me up for life. <laughs> like from what I've heard, like one, like twelve months is like the average. But some people take longer. Some people don't take as long. Yeah, I didn't know the actual age. I was just like, you're not supposed to feed babies honey. I just know that because I was yeah. told, do not feed babies honey. Yeah, I I, I was told that from a young and, age. Do not do not feed know, that child honey. <laughs> another um, little plot hole. Like so, was it Feng Feng Ming Feng Ming Feng Feng Ming? Min. Yeah. All right, uh, Adua's uh, retainer lady, lady in waiting, head lady in waiting. She comes from a family that has a bunch of uh, their oh my god, what a- a- P- apiarists, a- apiarists, apiary. Apiist. Yeah, they, they own they an they apiary. They're they're apiarists. They raise bees. They raise bees, and their honey is apparently super great and fine. Everybody loves it. And I found it weird that her lady in waiting, who comes from a family who harvests honey, does not know. Don't feed babies honey. Baby, but, yeah, you know, that again, was right, a surprise I'm, to me. I'm going to logic something else out here because I just thought about it. Like, well, babies were dying all the time regardless anyway. So did yeah. they connect the dots back then? I don't they know. They might. I don't, you know what? I don't they might know not when. Have. Well, because so like coming from an Asian culture, I ha- there are a lot of weird rules that we like. Um, What are they called? Like housewife stuff. Housewife? Hmm. Wives tales. There's wives a lot of tales, wives' yeah. tales that I've heard. Like, I remember, uh, for example, my aunt, when she gave birth to her twins, she wasn't allowed to take a shower for, like, a month. What? And she was I not allowed to, and, and she was not allowed to bring the babies into anyone's houses for the first month. This is something that we before. do. Apparently, this is, something, this is a wives' tale. And it has something to do with, like, the... Um, because it, going into other people's houses, there's other bacteria there. It'll kill the baby. Mm. And there's something about, like, uh, when you shower, you get rid of the natural shell. or I don't know. There's the whole thing. There's a whole thing about it. About how you're not supposed to shower the baby for a month and stuff like that. I don't know, man. I don't know these wives' tales. But I know that we. I be, my family believes in wives' tales. And wives' tales exist for a reason. It's because people notice over time, hey, if we do a certain thing certain things happen like dead babies will happen so i figure in my mind I, you know honey has been around for a long time we've been harvesting honey for a long time Thousands i feel years. like a long time yeah for a family that raises bees they would have wives tales about not feeding babies honey yeah i just feel like that that's the thing but again i didn't do the research i don't know but it, it's just to me surprising that this lady who comes from a line of family uh, a family of honey people would not know this like yeah. what the heck kind of weird moving on yeah moving on <laughs> yeah. that i will i will say that whole thing though was a really compelling mystery that got solved um mostly because there's so much like conniving going on behind the scenes and i think that's kind of what made it more enjoyable for me and it also leads to the fallout of like mau mau getting uh fired or let go um because after this after all this comes out right the head lady in waiting the fen ming she gets executed for all this because like you should have known better you shouldn't have killed a baby like this and that also leads to but that's not the what she fam- was being charged for what was she actually being charged for then she was the one that oh. was in charge of bullying um young young concubine oh that's right i'd completely She's the one forgotten who about to that poison him yeah, I yes, I'd completely forgotten about it. Like, yeah, she's the uh, the like the mastermind behind it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I completely forgotten about that. Like, yeah, she had her reasons, but she was the perpetrator. I mean, to be fair though, I think John is right. Coming from a family who raises bees, she probably should have known better. She should have known better. But um, uh, she's a real one because she's like, I love my um, I love my concubine lady so much so that I'm willing to try to get her uh main competition which is this young girl to like freaking die 
Which yes. is like, damn, okay, she she a G, like holy shit. And as it turns out, like Adua and uh the young concubine lady are actually like mother daughter relationship st- status. So I'm like, again, weird that you would be one of her ladies in waiting, but would choose to try to kill her because you're like doing it for your concubine mistress. But she has a mother daughter relationship with her anyway. I'm telling you, narcissism, not even once, man. It'll kill you. <laughs> I mean, it literally I get, will. I get the reason why it was like, well, if I kill the young consort, uh, she will get replaced instead of Adua because Adua is old and she apparently can't have kids anymore. Yeah. And that that leads to the whole like getting drunk on the roof thing with Jingxi and then learning about her. And then it's just like, oh, man, Jingxi is, is actually her son. Like, oh, my God. <laughs> Yeah, he is the son of the uh, prior emperor, and he is and the Adul. son of Adul. Yeah, like her baby didn't actually die; it was the emperor's baby that died, uh, because of uh, Fen Ming, and it's uh, Jing Shi is the child that is Adul's I, child. That's like, oh my god! I like, I like that that like in her little like drunken depression, she mentioned like, I just want to see my son. And what she's meaning by that is, I want to see my son as my son, not as this eunuch that I have to see him as. Yeah. For appearances. Uh, yeah, that it's was a great. deeply involved story, and that, I genuinely loved it. That that back and forth between them is is really really good. Um, yeah. So like like I said, after this, Finming gets executed. Um, the fallout from it is that. Um, uh, Mao Mao and a bunch of other servants get let go. Um, and then Mao Mao just gets rehired as Jinshi's assistant. Yeah, he couldn't live without Jinshi her. was like, man, I'm as whipped. Her. Yeah, he is. He <laughs> really man's is. Whipped. whipped. <laughs> Boy, whipped. <laughs> um, and then, like, very shortly after this, we have that, like, that scene that I mentioned before where you get Mao Mao uh, educating the consorts on serving the emperor. <laughs> Yeah, because funny. again, Mao Mao was raised in a brothel, so she she, she has knows picked the mechanics. Up these, she knows the mechanics of it. Whether or not she's experienced, we don't know. Uh, I'm like, I feel like she's ninety nine percent like she's sure not. she's a virgin. I mean, just, that might be copium. Just saying, she grew up in a brothel, guys. No, she did, but I'm pretty damn sure she's she hasn't. Mm. No, no one can I, say. Who knows? Who knows? Anyway, moving on. <laughs> um, so then we God. get to the next like arc, which is like a series of mysteries about like who done it, and yeah, it kind of just like it's like mystery after mystery, like the whole uh, who blew up the workshop, who um, you know, how do you open this box that this blacksmith guy left behind? Who poisoned this man? And it's just like a random series of mysteries that have been going throughout the palace this entire time yeah. that don't seem like they're interlinked until we realize that they're actually interlinked. And it's like, well, what? Yeah. <laughs> it, yeah. It's also, slow, but, like, it starts fitting in once, like, the characters actually start talking and thinking about it. For for the mystery, though, with the, the blacksmith, the metal worker, and his sons, where they have to, like, recreate the tea party, like, I don't, for whatever reason, that to me comes off as some kind of, like, Chinese proverb, and I don't know why I feel that way. No, it, it feels like they're one of those <laughs> stories. It, it does. It, ge- it genuinely feels like the kind of story you would hear in like an ancient Chinese proverb. And I'm like, just the way it, the way it, it's presented, it's it's great. I love it because the um, the the eventual like solution to the problem that they're having is solved through logic. I love that. Yeah, but I don't know. Just Mau Mau pulls wait. off the Sherlock Holmes, like, <laughs> elementary, my dear Watson. <laughs> also, is it, is it was it funny to any of you that, like, the whole thing with figuring out how to open the lock on the dresser uh, was revolving around melting lead? And the first thing that Mau Mau does is figure out something about lead poisoning? No, yeah, because, not really. Well, I mean, I mean again... Mao Mao is a apothecary, so she's seen a bunch of diseases and understands that people die after doing it, especially with metalworking. A lot of people yeah. work with metal will die of lead poisoning because people use lead because lead is – is uh, it's well, Especially very, back then. Yeah, lead is very uh, malleable. It's like soft. It's very it's malleable. Super, it's very malleable if you heat it up. It's also very heavy and used in a lot of things because it's because it's so – it's like a – it's tough, but it's also soft. So it's like it's very good, to, easy to work with. 
Yeah, it's like all the, lots the of it. Yeah, yeah, Plenty it's, it's it easy to. It's, it lead is everywhere on this planet. Like if you look at like all the the Roman like plumbing systems back in the day, it was all made out of lead because it was easy to work. And that's with. why the kingdom went crazy and destroyed itself. <laughs> <laughs> they all got <laughs> among lead poisoning. Other reasons, <laughs> among other reasons. Uh, so something else that happens in this whole stretch of investigations is um, Lachan is introduced. Um, Lachan is uh, Mau Mau's actual like biological father. Yes. Um, and he's also kind of crazy and maybe autistic. I don't know. <laughs> Can we talk? So we talked about this last night. Are are we all convinced that he's actually autistic and that's what the face blindness thing is about? Listen, I'm pretty I'm damn sure. He, he, I, I just was like, I think he might be autistic. I don't know. I don't know enough about this to say I'm not a certified professional to let you know if this man is on the spectrum or not. Uh, cause we're all a little bit on the spectrum, a little, like everyone's all on the spectrum a little bit, but I don't know like how severe his is. However, I do know that he has a hard time communicating and understanding people's emotions. He has a disconnect with it. In fact, he doesn't care about relations at all and he can't recognize people's faces. And I'm like, you know what? That sounds very much like, um, <laughs> there's a checklist here. <laughs> yeah. Like it, it sounds, it's checking off a lot of lists to me. There, there is a diagnostic checklist that is forming here. <laughs> But of course, uh, who knows? Who knows? Who knows? See, I, I, I kind of feel like it is supposed to be a representation of it in a sense, but I also feel the same way about um, uh, Mau Mau's mother. I feel like maybe she has, she may be on the spectrum a little bit too. I because, don't know like, about that, Chief. I, I, I don't know, didn't see enough like, evidence. When you see, no, when you see when you see her backstory, especially when you're looking at it through like Lockin's, uh perspective of it. Granted, that may be a very skewed perspective uh, because we see it literally from his point of view. Uh, you see her like being like really, really good at games of logic and then being a little bit socially awkward, kind of. I don't know. For me, it comes off as maybe a little bit on the spectrum. I, I mm. Again, I have no idea. No idea. I don't know. I, I think you're anyway. reading way too much into it. Maybe, maybe it is just me putting. You know, we're not professionals. We don't know. This is all speculation, and we're all just a bunch of we're, we're a bunch of idiots. So, you know, yes. take it with a grain of salt. Um, but one thing I absolutely loved was that confrontation that builds up between Lachan and, and Mal Mal because, like, when when like she finds out that he's in the palace, she does a lot of stuff to try to avoid ever meeting him. But then it almost becomes unavoidable. Like you have that one scene where, well, because Mal Lacan like, eventually, so Lacan is like this. Uh, he's an, an advisor or something. A military yeah. advisor. Military. Advisor, and it's like yeah. he's bored and he likes to visit Jingxi because he's like he understands. He's like he knows who Jingxi is, right? Yeah. No one else understands who Jingxi is other than like I guess Mao Mao figures it out as well. And his uh, he, his assistant Gaoshan also knows. Well, yeah, because his assistant Gaoshan is also not a eunuch. Mm -hmm. as we learn later on he's also not a eunuch um he has kids he's taking the medicine with jinxi but he's there as jinxi's bodyguard because as it turns out we know who jinxi is and but it all culminates into lock on basically taking an interest in jinxi because he's like oh, oh you're like you're actually royalty but why are you here what are you guys doing over there and then he figures out like how are you figuring out all these mysteries you're not that smart jinxi so that's how he pick puts two and two and he's like i've heard that there's a new apothecary person here and he's like, I know someone who could be that smart who comes from the House of Verdigree. And he's like, that's my daughter. That is 100% my daughter. So he mm -hmm. puts all these tests to uh, Mao Mao's, like, because he knows, like, if she's my daughter, then she won't be able to resist a, a good mystery, a good yeah. whodunit. Yeah. Yeah. And he's right. He knows it runs in his bloodline. Hell, he even puts uh, puts out that test of like the blue 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 roses, right? Yeah, and she figures it out. She just grows white roses and and makes them grow in uh, water that's dyed blue. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I I love the the eventual confrontation that happens between Locke and, and Mau Mau, and you see like a preview of it in one in an earlier episode before they have their little chess match, um, where uh, Mau Mau figures out that there's like a piece of metal that's been sabotaged. Yeah, so the, all the all the random coincidences were actual not random coincidences and it all culminates to like they want to kill someone today and she figures it out and it's like I need to go fucking go and save it's the Jinxi. person. 
And it turns out it's Jing Shi doing so the ceremony true. thing, which is like again yeah. weird because why would a eunuch be doing one of the royal family um ceremonies? ceremonies. Which is again just a lead into us just to confirm in case you didn't see the writing on the wall so far that Jing Shi's part of the royal family. Yeah. <laughs> He's actually uh one of the princes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, on, on the way to like run to save him, um, she gets stopped by one of the guards who beats the shit out of her. By the way, um, and well, before, Locken's the before one all step- this, I want to I want to mention real quick when the first time Jinchi actually talks about uh, her possibly meeting uh, Lachan and the face she gave. Oh yeah, the absolute cold the hatred she gave, and how the anime did it too. Like it was a one less than a second blip that like like the if, if you were face, watching yeah. you're like the fuck just happened and you have to go yeah. back like what the fuck did i just miss and like the face was just absolute cold hatred i loved it so much i was like oh shit that's scary yeah, yeah. and as it turns out uh we learn later on uh once we resolve the whole lock on our story arc we do learn that he learned about mao mao her existence early on he knew that she was alive but he also wasn't able to visit her but he's been trying to contact her multiple times and like visit her and stuff but because he's a military advisor he can't visit the house of verdicry all the time like every day so he'd drop by like once a month or something and just try to see if he could see mama his daughter because he he wanted to see her because he has yeah. a daughter yeah, yeah. but which, at this I, point he believes that mama's Mau mother is dead which i'm just like that's, that's another one of the plot hole things where i'm like I don't know, Lacan. It feels like you should have known better, but I'm like, I'll talk about that a little bit later. But it all resolves into Lacan like showing up and be like, "Oh, you're gonna go solve the mystery, huh? Let's go see if you can go save that person, the royal family person." So she goes in and she actually does save, it, and it turns out it's Jingxi, but she gets fucked up in the process and breaks her leg. Yeah, the thing falls and like actually like opens her leg up. So then, uh, during the walkout where Jingxi's carrying her. And then the look on Lockon's face of like, holy fuck, it went <laughs> He's too like, far. I did not ante- anticipate yeah, this. The one thing that he didn't anticipate was actually like her not getting there uh, nearly in time. Like, and it's, it, getting there and escaping. Like, he thought it was going to be fine because she was going to be able to get in there and like everything wouldn't fall and fuck everyone up. But as it mm-hmm. turns out, his plan was um, not as foolproof as he thought. And this is actually a great foreshadowing thing again, because this also revolves around what happens later with lock on story arc about Mao Mao's mom. Like, yeah, again, another thing that makes you feel he might be autistic is he has plans. And when things don't go to plan, you kind of fall to shit. Yeah. Like, it's like he has that little the internal panic attack when he realizes, Oh shit, I've gone too far. <laughs> well, it didn't go according to plan as he yeah. wanted it to. Like he had, he's like all fucked up over. He's like, oh my god, it it didn't perfectly work out. Like, cause you know, to him, life has always been a series of him playing people and everything working out how he ex- exactly expected it to. Yeah, until he so, met um, Mao Mao's mother, like everything and everyone was just a game to him. Yeah, yeah. Um, I also like the actual confrontation when they actually sit down and play chess. Um, and like they have, they set up the rules with the alcohol and it's like, it's, it's all like mixed up. So you never know whether you're getting alcohol or not alcohol. And like, I'm thinking to myself, okay, I know alcohol is poison. So Mau Mau should be fine. <laughs> well, but then, like, it's, the whole... uh, <laughs> it's hint. We learned that Mau Mau likes to fucking drink early yeah. on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Girl yes, can drink. Mau- she can hold her own. <laughs> Mau Mau may indeed be an alcoholic in 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 waiting. I just I'm just throwing that out there. I don't um, think it's in waiting. No, no I, I, I do love that. I do love that scene earlier on where uh, 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 Jinji is talking about lower or raising the age of consumption for alcohol or instituting an age of like consumption for alcohol. It's like don't do that. <laughs> this is the one thing I have, that. bro. Come on. <laughs> I have so little to live for. Why would you take that away? Um, but no, that confrontation is all hinged on the fact, which is also set up because you always see him drinking fruit juice and not alcohol. Um, that he's a teetotaler; he doesn't he doesn't consume alcohol. So one drink and he gets fucked. Yeah. He's the he's the type of person who always likes to be in control, and that yes. includes his physical body. So uh, something that would impair it is something he would not partake in. 
Yeah, which which plays into his the personality they have established for him so well. Um, just that that constant pathological desire and need to be in control of absolutely everything around him. Yeah. So then we finally get to the uh, the final story arc, which is like the resolving the whole lock on story arc, like the father daughter and mother thing. And mm-hmm. as it turns out, like. I, I did not fully expect I went into this episode going like lock has been an ambassador this entire time. Like, fuck that dude. And then we get to his backstory. And I'm like, OK, all right. Like, Maybe not fuck this dude. This guy, like, you know, shit. he, he, he asks his bad. he's he's not a bad guy. Actually, <laughs> nothing was actually his fault. And as it turns out, turns it's like out. he met. Yeah, everything he, he was meets... shit circumstance. That's all it yeah, was. Yeah, everything was just shit circumstance. I'm like, bro, I feel bad for this guy. Like, yeah. he actually loved uh, Mau Mau's mom. He actually wanted to be with her, but because he's fucking autistic, <laughs> allegedly, <laughs> according to my opinion, my non expert opinion, uh, he didn't pick up on the signs of what she was putting down yeah. about, like, what she was doing. And I was like, you fool! You absolute you... fucking fool! <laughs> you fell for it. Yeah, and it's like, oh god, it was so sad to hear. Like he gets, uh, so he he keeps playing uh, with Mau Mau's mom, like whatever at every opportunity that he can, until eventually, like Mau Mau's mom was like, "Fuck it, let's have sex," because she doesn't want to be sold off. So she concocts a whole plan without telling Lock on, because again, who cares about communication between two people who are fucking autistic? Um, <laughs> In my opinion, not an expert. Don't I, was, I was waiting for that. <laughs> <laughs> Got to preface everything, man. Don't want to be caught lacking. But uh, Mau Mau's mom is like about to be sold to this someone else for a high price. And she concocts this plan of like, well, I can reduce my value by getting pregnant. And then Lockon can afford to buy me. Mm-hmm. So Lockon doesn't know like this is going on. And then he unfortunately gets placed somewhere far away. Yeah, he like, gets next transferred th- out. He gets transferred like somewhere out for like three years, so he doesn't know what's actually going on. And when he comes back, he finds out that Mau Mau's mom is dead, and like the um the old lady, the pri- proprietress who runs Vertigree, is like, "You fucking bastard! You were supposed to come for, her and you never fucking showed up." Because it's like he didn't get it until like three years later that this is what happened. Yeah, until he, was he just got like, a letter when he got back. Yeah, because he was gone. He didn't know. And it's just like, oh, it's so fucked up. And then this is when we learn that uh, he had an uncle that he actually did like. And he didn't see as just a pawn. He saw him as a bishop and someone like kind of his guiding teacher. And also we learn that his uncle is the one who he was a, uh, a smart man, but he got disowned by his family because he got kicked out of the royal palace. And he used to be a doctor and they even cut off his thing. And then it's like... Oh shit! Lockon's uncle was, is Mau Mau's dad. What? It's a, it, what Mau Mau's dad is actually her great uncle. What? It's like what? <laughs> and again, that made me go nuts because I was like, wait, are you telling me that? Um, then, but that makes sense. It's like that's why he goes and helps out the kid because he finds out what happened. But they never mention it ever, and I'm like, what the fuck, dude? All this intrigue and shit that we don't just talk about because we don't learn a lot about Mau Mau and her family circumstances until the fucking end. Until it's like, oh, this is that really interesting. Holy, like you could have just made a whole season about just this, to be honest, the family drama. Yeah. Like, I mean, this I'm glad it wasn't thing. just that, but yeah. No, it I'm was glad it wasn't just that because it'd be a different type of show. But it was just like, yo, this is nuts. I didn't see none of this coming. Like, oh my God. There were so many twists upon twists and done so well. Yeah, I was like, just I like love, holy shit. I love watching mysteries. I love watching whodunits and stuff like that. You know, I love trying to guess like what's gonna happen. And again, you know, if, based off of the beginning, I was like, yeah, this show is pretty cut and dry. Everything is kind of making sense. And then the whole reveal about like the assassination attempt at uh, Jinxie's life. Uh, and then I was like, oh, I didn't see any of that coming. I didn't see th- that they all linked up. And I was like, that's very interesting. And then the whole lock on and Mau Mau's mom thing. I was like, I didn't see this at all. Holy fuck. I, I, what? <laughs> <laughs> but to be fair it's like and then it's like it's only on thinking about it now after watching all of it is like they bred from mm-hmm. us but we didn't know and i'm like no. damn that's good that's fucking good it's yeah. that obvious breadcrumb that we didn't see is what they did and my mm-hmm. god does it pay off mysteries like this is what i fucking live for because they set it up so beautifully and they don't make it super obvious 
And I yeah. fucking love it. And they didn't get another thing. They don't give any of this shit away in like the OP or ED or promotional materials either. So no, we no, truly is, did not yeah. know. God, imagine like, an anime that doesn't give away its entire plot in an OP. Couldn't be Apothecary Diaries. <laughs> and um, like my only caveat to this was like the whole like, okay, Lockon, you're supposed to be hella smart, bro. Like you should have fucking figured this out. Like I get that you went to go visit the old lady and she's like, you killed her. She's dead now. It's like it turns so um, Mau Mau's mom. So the reasons why she's so syphilitic is because after she she got pregnant, she loses her worth as a um. Oh my god. Concubine courtesan. Courtesan. Not concubine. I was yeah. gonna say concubine. I was like, she's not a concubine. Courtesan. So because she's lost her value because she was devaluing herself to get sold to uh Lock-On, but Lockon is gone now, no one will buy her. So and I I know people are gonna be upset about like, well, why did she get pimped out? And it's like, dude, you don't understand. Times were tough back in the day. They they gotta make money. Like you can't you can't just be a mouth that does nothing, right? You have to yeah. You have to do something yeah. to make money. It do, it does yeah. not happen. <laughs> you can't be a burden on those around you back then. Yeah, so she was now being a guest, and she's just like she, she has to serve people now because before she was known as the high ranking courtesan that was like super beautiful and intelligent, and she would never sleep with anyone. But there were some men who liked that because they're like, oh man, this bitch is like, dang, she's testing my wits right now. So you guys, there's some guys who like that, you know, a woman who gives her a little pushback and is like can challenge you intellectually, right? Yeah. There's a certain type, and like to them, like that makes sense too, because like sex is not primary to these type of people. So it makes sense to me why that would, uh, why she'd be Can popular I... with certain people. Yeah. Can I just say I feel like that's also part of the reason why Jinshi has a thing for Mao Mao. <laughs> it's not about like the looks; it's about the intelligence. Oh, no. absolutely. Even though don't get uh, me wrong, Mao like, Mao he... is freaking beautiful. Yeah. 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 I think he's more interested in her because she's an intelligent, like literate woman. Yeah, it's more about and she the, fights um, him. And, yeah, she, more and about, she pushes back. It's more about their intellect and personality than it is about their looks. Yeah. Which is, you know, that's a great story in itself. But but then yeah, the because, fact that Mau Mau turns out to be a beauty uh, that gets revealed later is a definite plus for Jinchi. I mean, yeah, no one's going to be no one's going to be upset at the person that you liking actually being actually super beautiful. <laughs> Not only on the inside, but on the outside, too. Like, come on. Ten out of ten. I feel... I also, but I also, well, the, um, I was gonna say, I feel like the the conclusion to that whole lock on thing, where he actually meets Mao Mao's mother, and they have that reconciliation moment. That when was he finally wonderful. realizes that she's actually not dead. This is oh. one of my problems. Like, bro, you're supposed to be smart. How did you not realize she's not actually not dead? I, it's like all he knew know. was like, all right, I knew that I had a daughter, but that's it, and that's all I knew. And it's just like, bro, I mean, I get it. She cut off all contact. She's crazy now. She doesn't want to talk. So it's like there's no reason to believe that she's alive. That she she probably died to come to her um her syphilis. But I, was just, I then it just made me mad because I'm like, why did the proprietress just not tell her like she's actually still alive and like listen to Lockon when he's like, why didn't they just communicate? <laughs> he was I like, I'm know, sorry. Man. I was I wanted to come back. I couldn't. They stationed me away again. Simple communication problem. <laughs> it could but have been you easily resolved. But they you could, know I'm what? just saying that Lakan could have spent time with uh, Mau Mau's mom before she dies. Because they at the end, uh, Mau Mau's like, yeah, my mom doesn't have that much longer to live. So Lakan's going to spend the last like couple months with her. And yeah. I'm like, mm -hmm. Mau Mau's like the age of, I don't know, 15, 16 or something, right? Like, 17. We don't know how old. She's, she's, she's 17. 17. Yeah. Mau Mau's 17. All I'm saying is, if Lakan didn't know that uh, any of this existed, and he was gone for three years, mom, he could have spent an extra fourteen years with uh, the mom, I'm the just, woman that's that all he I'm supposedly loves. Yeah, and he truly did love her because even after all this time, he went to go see her, and you know, because of the whole face blindness thing, he doesn't see her with like all of her um, syphilitic injuries and stuff like that, and she's decaying. He just and dying. sees her. Yeah, he just sees her, and I'm just like, oh, dude, and that's what that, that hit me, bro. I was like. Damn, I wanted to hate you, Lock On. I really did. Like you're but a now piece I of can't. shit. You're stupid. But I'm like, he never stopped loving her, and it's just due to unfortunate circumstances that they couldn't be together. And I'm just like, ah, oh, damn and it. That's the true damn it. That's great. Stroke of the story. Oh, it really tragedy. Was. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that scene though, that reconciliation scene, just oh, that's so well done. It, the, it hit and a the voice note. acting in that. The voice acting in that scene is amazing. 
Oh, and then the fact that she stops being like, um, she actually recognizes Lock on too, and it's just like, oh, yeah. she's been waiting for you forever. She said she hated you, but she did, and she still loved you. Ah, ah, it hurts. It hurts. I'm like, you could have been together for the last 14 years, <laughs> you bitches. Why would you do this to them? They didn't do nothing wrong. Oh, it kills me, dude. It kills me. It's tragic. Yeah, and I, I will say, what makes it so beautiful. Before we wrap this up, the one last thing I wanted to talk about is that scene at the, near the very end where Mau Mau is dancing on top of the wall. Oh, bro, that was good so, shit. It was the shot animation. in 3D. It was shot in 3D, but they they interlaid 2D on top of 3D, so it's a 3D mm-hmm. scene. But it, they're doing 2D animation with Mau Mau dancing, and they do a lot of jump cuts to go to different angles to mm-hmm. really help hide the 3D, so it doesn't even like to me. It didn't matter. Uh, I noticed it because I'm like, I see 3D in the background. I see, I see that. <laughs> I see what you're uh, doing. I see what you're doing. But how they did the camera work and stuff really emphasized like the dancing and the motions. I loved it. That animation and was so fucking good. Absolutely for a, beautiful. For a moment, uh, when I was uh, when I was watching, I thought, okay, the camera jumping might be egregious. But like after it was done, I was like, no, that wasn't egregious. That was actually done extremely well. Mm-hmm. And holy shit. But yeah, the animation of uh, that whole dance, the um, music, and what the dance itself represented, uh, it was her giving her mother away um, in yeah, the style. Because like, uh, uh, Jinxi shows up and he's like, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I'm dancing. It's a tradition that we do at Vertigree. We will dance for the concubines that are being sold. And it's because his mom mm-hmm. is fine. Or her mom is being sold to lock on because yeah. he's like, Oh yeah, that's right. Lock on's taking a, a sabbatical for the next couple months. Yeah. And it's just like, Oh, they finally have their happy ending. And it's it was, just like, Oh my God, finally, it, was it hurts so much, bro. Ah, oh. in one, like this all happened story. in one episode, by the way, the whole lock on yeah, final episode. Like, this is all just like being shown to you. Like, sure. We had the build up for the last two episodes and stuff, but just like all this happening and just, one and a half episodes of story to tell. And I'm like, I'm feeling so many emotions about this. Like, ah, oh, this yeah. is good writing. God. It is. It is. Um, what a way to finish things off. Yeah. yeah. And and it has been announced. Um, I think it was announced at the very end of the final episode. Yeah, that at, this at is the very end of the second season. Episode, like, we're getting a season two, baby. I'm like, yes. Yeah, Let's did go. That well. Can I just uh, say, I, I honestly, want to go pick up the light novel and start reading it <laughs> because <laughs> I, was, I liked it so much. But it's like the reason I liked Apothecary Diary so much is because one, the voice acting with uh, Aoyuki is really good. But yeah, the content itself is really good. And it's like I'm at it. Uh, I'm I'm in a hard place where I'm like, do I want to continue to read this? Do I want to be ahead? surprised? But I also want to be surprised. Yeah, that's like especially when it comes to um, mystery shows. Like mm-hmm. I like trying to solve it myself. And yeah. if I read the novel, I'll be able to know all the answers. And I'm like, I don't want that this time. Yeah. It's the one time and where especially I don't, with it's the so fact good that, that how they did it is so well done. It's like, man, mm-hmm. this is a fun thing to write out on. Yeah. Now, one thing, one thing I don't know, I, I don't know exactly when it's going to air. They have said sometime in 2025, so we won't have to wait long for the second season. I don't. Le- about I a don't, year or so. I don't give a shit so long as the quality stays consistent. Oh. Like, just take your time, do it right. That that's all I need. One one hundred percent. Um. So yeah, I I'm super stoked for the second season. Give me more of this. Give me more of Mao Mao and Jinshi. That 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 character dynamic is great. I want to see more of it. Um. So I have to ask. Uh. For for all of us here to to wrap this up, what score do we give it out of ten? easy nine easy like other than some plot holes plot holes and logical um fallacies that i found with it i i don't have any other complaints like that's it Mm. the writing is fucking stellar the voice acting is stellar the music's fucking amazing it's beautifully animated there was never a dip in quality i never felt bored while watching it that's the best Mm -hmm. part never even though there's very little action well, because it's always interesting. No matter what was happening, it was something was interesting was happening, either in the background. And, and that's, you know, the or, thing that it feeds my little brain, like my little rat brain is like, hey, there's something happening. Put two and two together. It's like breadcrumbs, breadcrumbs. I got to keep thinking <laughs> about this. How How's it all going to plan out and yeah, work out? Like 
even though there's very little action, like there's stuff, there's stuff going on. Like there, there's either witty dialogue going on. There's something in the background. There's breadcrumbs being fed to you. It's like, there's always something, even though there's rarely any action to, to like draw your attention. Right. I mean, John already said everything <laughs> that yeah. I was going to say. Um, nine out of 10. Wow. Uh, damn near a masterpiece. Just a couple things missing here and there. A couple things that were a little bit off that knocked the score down. But wow, absolutely worth it. I've been recommending it to hell and back to everyone I yeah, could. Yeah, like this is, again, it's it's very rare for me to watch a show and be like, it was actually, it met the hype. In fact, I think this to me, this exceeded the hype. It is joining the, I think this is going to be the fifth anime that I've ever watched that has exceeded my expectations and lived up past, lived past the hype. Like mm. it's actually really that good. Cause again, yeah, everyone was like, well, the character diaries is really good. Everyone should watch it. Fucking 60,000 people had watched this and rated it like five out of five on freaking Crunchyroll. Like, no way. No way it's that good. Watch it. Damn it, they're right. It was that good. <laughs> and, and, and to just give like a, free rent. It was just, just it was like free all... rent. To give a little context, when we did our original uh, season preview for fall of 2023, I don't even think we talked about Apothecary Diaries. No, I, it was I don't, not on my no, radar. No. I don't think a lot it was of people on even nobody's talk... radar. Yeah. No one was actually knew about this or wanted to talk about this other than people who read it. And mm -hmm. then it just blew up because it's, it's just that great of a show. It is. Um, I So I originally had this at a 9 out of 10. And, like, I mm, I want to give it slightly higher. So I'm really going to say it's like a 9.5 out of 10. It's just ever so slightly off that 10 out of 10 for me. Yeah. But I, I, I wanted to give it a, a little bit higher than a 9 out of 10. On Mal, I ended up giving it a 9 out of 10 because you can't do half half scores. But for me, it's just it's just half a point away from being just a absolute masterpiece and the the things that are wrong with it the criticisms i do have are kind of nitpicky so i don't really care so much right that's fair yeah a lot like free run that i had to really 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 dig to find some criticisms for this anime <laughs> and we get it the dragon fight thing we get it stop talking about it in our fucking comments I mean, no, 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 keep talking in our comments. Keep talking. Please <laughs> give, give us engagement. I mean, yeah, hey, give us that engagement. I I'll not say no to engagement. We get it. <laughs> we get it. We over, we oversold it a little Listen, bit. No, it's copium, bro. <laughs> I literally compared it for you guys for for Natai. I it's it's all copium, bro. <laughs> I mean, it's a shame that Ty wasn't doing all that stuff he was doing in our private chat on our comment section. <laughs> That's all right. Other people were doing it. <laughs> For those, I could... just a little bit of context. It, we have a private chat on our Discord server, and Ty typed, like, an entire fucking novel's worth of, like, you're wrong, John. You're fucking wrong. <laughs> and little bro made me pull out the receipts. I pull, I went and got the episodes. I took them frame by frame. I tore them apart, broke he it down. I was did. like, little bro, compare, fight me. Let's Let's go. <laughs> the Half man words. is actually insane. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, I think that's all we got for Apothecary Diaries, unless yep. any of you have anything last to say about it before I sign us off. Nope. Uh, the only thing I got to say is, like, I did not expect um, last season to come out swinging with back-to-back -back hits, like Free Ren and Apothecary Diaries. Yeah, like, I, can crap. I just say, I, I, I want to say that the fall 2023 season – probably one of the best singular anime seasons we've had in quite a while it genuinely yeah. was with both free run apothecary diaries i mean we also had what the um uh the second season of spike's family we had second season of eminence and shadow what a great anime season yeah <laughs> bro anime we thought anime was dead anime is for well and alive yeah uh, some great stuff that's been coming out recently and if what's on the docket for not only right now this spring season that we're currently in of 2024 but later this year is any indication man we got this some bangers on the horizon the <laughs> all i'm saying is fall 23 was so hard that the best shows of winter 24 were fall 23 shows <laughs> yeah <laughs> just aired into hell even shangri-la frontier was the exactly same. Oh, that's Bro, even, exactly <laughs> 
<laughs> All right. Well, uh, thank you everyone for dropping in to watch us talk about Apothecary Diaries. Um, please do not forget to like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. Um, if you like what you saw and want to see more, let us know down below what you thought of Apothecary Diaries. Would you recommend it to anyone? Uh, let us know. Let us know. Also, check down below where you can find links to Anime Club After Dark on uh, Twitter, TikTok, Discord. Um, we also have a link to our merch store down there where you can buy Anime Club After Dark merchandise and uh, help us out here. Um, but with that all being said, I have been your host, Alex, and we will see you next time. Say goodnight, guys. Good night. Bye. I, I would go love to see Mau Mau take some LSD. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. Stop. Don't give drugs to the druggy. Hey, she would be so it. much fun. Get help. Bro, they don't have Narcan in this universe. Don't do that. <laughs> Man, you know that uh, uh, Mau Mau would invent it, though. <laughs> oh, she would. <laughs> Actually, Narcan is for opioids, and guess where opium's from? <laughs> Britain. Asia. <laughs> no, it wasn't originally. <laughs> Where's it originally from? It was introduced to them from the Middle East. Oh. By the British during by the whole day, yeah. bro. Let me tell you about British right fucked now. up everything. <laughs> yeah, let me tell you about. Tell it. your wife I said hi. <laughs> <laughs>